Do you ever struggle with fear? Do you ever struggle with fear? After the door to her small apartment closed in 1939, Marjorie Goff went out three times in the next 30 years. She went out once to get some ice cream for a friend who was sick. She went out a second time to have an operation, to have surgery. She went out a third time for a funeral of a relative. Aside from that, she entered her home on her, on her 31st birthday and didn't come out again until she was 61 years old. Why? She suffered from agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces. There's a truck driver who drives semis, and his fear was the Chesapeake Bay, Bay Bridge. He, he visualized this over and over again. He'd be driving over the bridge. He'd get in the middle of the bridge. He'd stop. He'd get out of his truck and jump into the water. This fear was so real for him that his wife offered to handcuff him to the steering wheel so he wouldn't harm himself. Now, I know these instances may seem ridiculous or strange, but there are hundreds of thousands of people today who are dealing with some sort of fear. It's reported that one out of 10 people deal with one of the 100 classified phobias. A phobia is an irrational fear about a common thing. Now today, we're not talking about specific fears, but I want to talk about how fear can enter into someone's life and begin to dominate that person. Now, now realize, fear is not a bad thing. God created us in such a way that we would have fear to help us during dangerous situations, give us a, a shot of adrenaline to help us through, through a difficult time, a dangerous time. But when fear becomes a permanent condition, it can paralyze our spirit. It can penalize our life. Well, I'm sure we've all met fear I've been at home when the phone rings and, and there's a mom screaming, come quickly, tragedy struck. I've been with families as they stand and, and watch their loved one fighting for their life. I've, I've prayed with church families because one of their children went missing. I've been with partial families when they shared the news, we're getting a divorce and the devastation that does to the children. I've been called to come when a family has received some not-so-good news from the doctors. And most parents, most parents know the fear of walking our children to school for the very first time. Fear takes over in these situations, and, and it hits us like a ton of bricks. Someone has defined fear this way. It's a small trickle of doubt that runs through your mind and wears such a deep rut that eventually all our thoughts are drained into it. Boy, that's a good definition, isn't it? A small trickle of doubt that runs through your mind and wears such a deep rut that eventually all our thoughts drain into it. You know, the Bible paints pictures of God's people being fearful. Remember when Jesus sent the disciples out into the sea? They get in the middle of the sea and a storm pops up and they're fearful. And they wake Jesus up. And what's he do? He speaks the word. He calms the sea. Why? To calm them down, to calm their fears. In the Old Testament, remember, you have a young shepherd boy named David. And he's taking supplies to his older brothers who are serving in King Saul's army. And when he gets there, he hears this giant of a man taunting the living God. And he's asked, what's, what's going on? What's, what, why, why aren't you guys going out and take care of this guy, clown? Why? Because they were all fearful. And so David steps up and he goes and confronts the giant. Of course, we know how God gave him victory over that. But I think the Old Testament story that best illustrates fear is when the 12 spies went out into the promised land and returned and gave a bad report. In Numbers chapters 13 and 14, it gives us a more detailed account about it. But in Numbers or Deuteronomy chapter 1, we have a review. And that's going to be our main text for today. Remember the situation. God's people, the Israelites, were in Egypt. They were in slavery. They were in bondage. They kept crying out to God. And God heard their cries. And God called Moses and told him to go back and lead the people out of freedom. Moses goes down and he confronts Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses, or Pharaoh says, no, no, 
And so God sent a plague. And it happened again and again and again. Ten times, ten plagues. Finally, the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh said, go on, get out of here. The people gave the Israelites their silver and gold. Go on, leave us alone. And Moses leads them out. Under the leadership of God, they come to the Red Sea. And, and then Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army after him, remember? And, and they're, they're coming after him. And, and God opened up the Red Sea and says, all God's people walk across on dry ground. They get to the other side and Pharaoh's army starts to come after them. And God closed up the waters. They all drowned. And, and God is leading them. He, he wants to take them to the promised land. They're, they're on the threshold of a land flowing with milk and honey. The land that God had promised to give to them. And so the 12 spies go in and check out the land. And when they came back, they gave a report. And we're going to see the results of allowing fear to rule a, a person's life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now, it starts in verse 19, but I'm going to start reading in verse 21. And verse 21 says, Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. The first result we see is that fear disregards God's plan. Fear disregards God's plan. God had given them a command to take the land, but they couldn't or they wouldn't. Why? Because fear took hold of their lives. God had already told them the land was theirs, and yet they were paralyzed with fear. If you let fear dominate your life, it will keep you from experiencing what God has planned for your life. Folks, understand, as Christians, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's been a time in our life when we recognize we're sinners, we repented of our sin, received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We are, are called disciples or we're called Christians. As Christians, we have an inheritance today. We have an inheritance in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. When we let fear control or rule our lives, we are forfeiting the plan that God has for our life. If we have asked Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord, then he has given us a great, great promise. He's given us a tremendous inheritance. It's found in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Notice what he says here. But you, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Being led by the Spirit of God does not always mean that we're totally surrendered to him. Think of it this way. We, we could move to another part of the world. We could live in another country. But we could live according to our customs, to our patterns, to our language, to our ways. You know, we would move there and live under a, a different law, but we would still hold to our custom and patterns. You know, for many people, that's the way it is. They become Christians, but they want to hold to the old pattern, the old ways that they used to live. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, leads God's children. And, and sometimes he leads us through those difficult circumstances, but primarily he leads us through illustrating and, and clarifying the scriptures to us. The Holy Spirit makes the Bible understandable to our sinful, finite, finite minds. Again, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. See, the Word of God today tells us that His plan for us as adopted sons and daughters of the living God is that we're no longer slaves to fear, that we are to walk in the power of God's love. Amen? Again, back to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, it says, Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Here, the second result we see is that fear distorts God's purpose. Fear distorts God's purpose. You see, when fear dominates our life, everything gets out of perspective. Everything is distorted. I want you to notice the progression of what happened here. First thing is they rebelled against the command of the Lord. They rebelled. Understand, we're talking about a heart condition here. 
They rebelled against God's command. Do we ever do this? Do we ever rebel against God's command? For example, God's command says we're to honor our father and mothers, but do we do that? Young people are saying, well, yeah, if I agree with them, then I will. (laughs) But God has given a command for us as Christians as well. In Luke chapter 9, in verse 23, Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me. Now understand, as a born-again believer, we are supposed to be disciples. We're supposed to follow Jesus. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. But do we do it? Or do we rebel in our hearts saying, oh, I don't think I want to do that today, Lord? The first thing we see here is that they rebelled against God's command. Secondly, they complained in their tents. They complained in their tents. Have you ever complained about God in your home, your workplace, your school? Do you ever mumble and grumble? Oh, God, that's not fair. Do you ever say anything like that? You know, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, we see Jesus is talking with the Pharisees, and it says he knew their thoughts. Jesus knows your thoughts and my thoughts. We, we don't always have to say words. He knows our thoughts. And then he goes on in, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36 and 37. Jesus said, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. Every word we say. Boy, that's, that's a lot of words that we're going to have to be accountable for, isn't it? And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So understand, Jesus can hear our mumbling, our grumbling, our complaining. He can hear when our words are not edifying and building people up, encouraging one another. He hears all those words, and we're going to be held accountable for them. Well, thirdly, they said, the Lord hates us. The Lord hates us. Now, is that true? No. No. No, God loved them. God had a plan. God had a purpose for them. But maybe you're sitting here today and and you may feel that way. You feel like God doesn't really love you. You struggle with that. But in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 it says, But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you and I were still in rebellion, still going our own way, doing whatever we want to do, Christ died for us. Folks, understand, the cross proves God's great love for each and every one of us. And fourthly, they believed God's goal was to destroy them. They believed that God's goal was to destroy them. As believers in Jesus Christ, do you know what God's goal is for your life? There's so many Christians today, they're they're confused. They don't know, what is it, God, you want in my life? In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now understand, the thief here refers to Satan and all the demonic forces of hell. And Satan's battle plan, his game plan, is the same today as it was back then, as it will be to the end of times. And that is, he came to steal, kill, and destroy He came to steal our joy. He came to kill, to literally take our life if possible. And he came to destroy our testimony. But Jesus doesn't end with that. He said, I have come that you may have life more abundantly. This describes something that goes far beyond what is necessary. He's talking about eternity. We're going to have abundant life and eternity spending with God. But also here and now while we're living on this earth, we could have abundant life here. But we'll never enjoy the abundant life if our focus is on safety, security, and selfishness. So how do I begin to have the abundant life? It starts by believing God and trusting Him that He knows what He's doing, that He has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. Now remember, the ten men came back with a distorted picture. They told the Israelites, we can't do this. There's giants in the line. We can't do that. They did not believe God. They did not trust God. Now, here's the facts. Yes, there were some large people living in the land, but not all of them were large people. But isn't that exactly what fear does? It just exaggerates the situation. It takes one giant, and all of a sudden, you got to feel the giants. 
oh, there's a giant here, there's a giant there, there's a giant behind every tree you look at. You feel intimidated. And when fear controls your life, rationality goes out the window, everything is distorted. If you let fear take over your life, you can be sure that you will not be looking at things correctly. You will have a distorted view of reality. Again, back in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28, it says, Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakin there. The third result is that fear discourages and permeates others. Fear discourages and permeates others. Folks, understand, fear will affect others around you. Notice what they said, our brothers have discouraged us. You know what they're saying? God, it's not my fault. I wanted to go into the promised land, but you heard them. You got to give them a little bit of credit because at least they didn't do like Adam. It's their wife's, you know, it's a woman you gave me. It's her fault. At least they're blaming their brother instead of their wives, right? I don't know about you, but I hate it when someone cannot take responsibility. Oh, it's not my fault, God. It's, it's because they came back. They gave a bad report. That's why we didn't do it. <sighs> Folks, please do not miss this. If you miss, don't miss this part of the message. The course of this nation was changed just by the testimony of 10 spies. The course of this nation was changed. The 10 spies instilled fear in the, in the entire nation. Remember back in Genesis 18, God came and visited with Abraham. And God's saying, should I keep what I'm going to do from Abraham? No, I'm going to tell him. He's, he said that, that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And remember what Abraham does? Because his nephew Lot is living in the city. So he begins negotiating with God. God, if there's 50 righteous people there, will you not destroy it? God said, no, for 50, I, I'll, I'll save it. And then he keeps going down to 45 and 40 and down. He finally gets down to 10. God says, for 10 righteous, 10 righteous people, I'll not destroy it. But you know what happened? They go in there, they couldn't find 10 righteous people. Here we see a bad report of 10 spies change the course of this nation. Now, Joshua and Caleb had this very same set of facts, but they interpreted them completely different. In Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29 in verse 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Well, next we see that fear disbelieves God's promises. Fear disbelieves God's promises. Here you have in verses 29 through 33, kind of a quick overview of what God did. And in verse 32, it says, You did not believe in the Lord your God. Folks, understand, the, this challenge wasn't God's first introduction to them. They had seen God work over and over and over again, being delivered out of slavery and bondage of Egypt, providing for them. And, and God carried them through. He provided food in their trip in the, through the wilderness. He provided guidance for their journey. He fought their battles. They had experienced God's miraculous ways again and again and again and again and again. And yet now they don't believe the word of God. They said, we, we can't do it. Everything God had done for them, had taught them through the years, was thrown out the window. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how important faith is. Because faith builds a spiritual muscle. But with each experience of stretching my faith, it, it feels like I'm back at the beginning of my spiritual journey. It would seem like I should be able to trust God by remembering what he's done for me through the years, how he came through over and over and over again. I should just say, well, God is faithful. He got me through in the past. He'll get me through it again. And yet it seems like I often fall back to square one. And the Israelites are a certain illustration of this fall. They would not, they would not believe that God would give them the promised land. Well, again, back in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 26 Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. Instead of going forward and singing victory song they, and marching forward in faith, they sat in their tents crying and mumbling and grumbling and complaining, preparing to go back to Egypt. 
Oh, let's go back to slavery and bondage. It was so good back then, right? It goes on in verse 34 and 35 and says, And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land of which I swore to give to your fathers. The fifth result is that fear disobeys God. Fear disobeys God. It purposely rejects God's best in our life. Fear purposely rejects God's best in our life. You know, there are 365 fear knots in the Bible, one for each day of the year. If we fear, if we fear, we're doing what God tells us not to do. Now, now it's important that we understand God's great desire for each and every one of us is to walk by faith. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, he says, Now the just, understand, if you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been justified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, Right? And so he's talking about here the just. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in them. God wants his sons and daughters to walk by faith. That's what he desires for each and every one of us, to walk by faith. Understand, faith, our fear destroys faith. Fear destroys faith because they did not believe God in his promise. God would not provide what he promised to do to them. Because they would not believe God, God would not provide what he promised to them. And it's the same way with us today. He had vowed to give them the promised land. And we see this whole generation that did not believe God and was prohibited from going into the promised land. All the adults, all the adult generation of Joshua and Caleb was forbidden to enter the land. And they ended up wandering for 40 years in the wilderness until that whole generation died off. Only two adults that we know of were able to enter the promised land. That was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb dwelt in the promised land. And I've often wondered, how many funerals did they attend? Remember what they're doing? They're waiting for that, quote, evil generation to die off. That's what verse 35 tells us. Now, I, I, I question, how many funerals were the, did these men go to? In Numbers chapter 1, verse 46, it says... There were 603,550 men, 20 years old and older. Okay, for the sake of this illustration, I'm just going to double that because I'm going to say there's about that many women. So 603,550 men times two comes up to 1,207,100 people. Give or take 100, right? <laughs> okay, 40 years of wandering. 365 days in a year times 40 years, that's 14,600 days of wandering. If you take 1,207,100 people, divide it into 14,600 days, that's 82.6 deaths each day. Now, if you take a 12-hour day for funerals, that means you would have six to seven funerals per hour for 365 days for 40 years. Can't you just hear now? Hey, Joshua, what are you up to today? Oh, going to a funeral. What are you going to do this afternoon? Oh, I'm going to a funeral. What are you going to do tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to a funeral. What are you doing next week? Oh, I'm going to a funeral. <laughs> what are you doing next year? Oh, I'm going to a funeral. <laughs> Can you imagine what that must have been like? You see, the children who they were afraid would be destroyed by the giants, they're actually the ones who are going to enter the promised land under Joshua's leadership. I wonder how many people, how many Christians have you seen fear control their life, control their future? They say something like this. Well, I, I sense God told me to do this, uh, but you know, I couldn't. And they, they give you some lame excuse why they couldn't. The bottom line is they were fearful. They, they were afraid to obey God. They didn't do what God wanted to do. And, and you know what you're going to find if you watch their life? It ends up being a meaningless life. They have a meaningless journey. And, and I can't help but wonder, do you, think, do you think the younger generation might have resented mom and dad just a little bit? We're just wandering around here in the wilderness because you didn't have the courage to obey God. You were afraid to go in when God promised you he'd give you this land, yet you were afraid to walk in? Do you, do you think there might have been a little bit of resentment there simply because they wouldn't trust the Lord? Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I want to tell you what my prayer is. My prayer 
is that God would allow me to be faithful and trust him so that I can pass on the baton of faith to my, to my children and my grandchildren and the generation that comes behind me. I don't want them looking at me and, and saying, well, why didn't you just trust God? Why did you go forward? What's your desire? What is it that you really want? Do you want to waste your life and, and wander in the wilderness or do you want to step forward in obedience to what God's called you to do? Well, we go on back to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 40. It tells us specifically, but as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Go ahead. This is what you want. Go into the wilderness. Here we see that fear dispels God's potential for us. Fear dispels God's potential for us. The, the spirit of fear could dominate a life and keep, it keeps God from doing what he wants to do in your life. Verse 41, we see the people repented. They said, hey, we can go into battle. Come on, let's go. In verse 42, God says, no, 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 no. It's too late. Don't go. But they didn't listen. The people went into battle and they got soundly defeated. You see, the first rebellion was a rebellion of unbelief. The second rebellion was a rebellion of arrogance. In verse 43, it says, so I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountains. You presumptuously went up thinking God was going to give you victory when he told you not to go. Verse 45, then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. Give ear to you. They spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, wasting their lives, just waiting to die. And my question for you, how many here just want to live a meaningless, useless life? Just get through, just get through this life until you die. How many of us really want that? Oh, I just want to waste my life. Just sit around, wait till I die. I doubt if anybody here really wants that. And so that brings us to a very important question. Come on, say it with me. So, so what? So what can I do? Well, the first thing we have to do is confront our fear honestly. Confront our fear honestly. We have to confront fear. It will not go away. We have to understand what it is that causes us to fear. Too often I have people come to me and say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know what I'm, I'm afraid of, but I, I'm overcome with fear. You need to ask God to show you what that fear is and, and confront it. We cannot run from fear. Now, folks, realize an important truth here. When, when they finally entered the promised land, they had to fight for it. There is a battle. They had, they had to fight for every piece of land they had. And many people today think something like this. Well, if I give my problems, if I give the battle over to the Lord... That's it. He's just going to take it and instantly make it go away. And I say, he may do that. He, he may instantly take things away. But he usually guides us through the battle. He usually helps us take one step at a time to know how to get through those difficult situations we're facing. Remember in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it tells us we're to be a living sacrifice. That is to be totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. Understand the simple truth. A growing, maturing Christian will encounter pain and battles. A growing and, and, a, a growing and maturing Christian will encounter pain and battles. He goes on in Romans 12, verse 2, he, he said we're to be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. And here's the biggest battle any of us are going to face. It's renewing that mind. You see, many of us grow up in, in an environment, we, we, we hear ungodly teaching, we think, oh yeah, that's good. But then we've got to come back to God's word. And God's word is truth, absolute truth. And we have to renew our minds. God, what do you say about this? This is the biggest battle most of us are going to fight. We have to retrain our minds. And why do we do this? So that we can know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This, this is where real fulfillment and satisfaction are found. Becoming what God created us to be no matter what the cost. When you step forward and say, God, I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. You do whatever needs to be done in my life. You change me. That's when real satisfaction and fulfillment come. When we take that step.
First of all, we have to confront fear honestly. Secondly, confess your fear to the Lord. First we confront it, then we confess to the Lord. See, if God says fear not and we're fearful, understand we're in sin. So we have to confess that to the Lord. We, we can fill our, our minds with God's truth. For example, in Psalm 34, verse 4, it says, The fear of man brings a snare. Or in Psalm 34, not, not Proverbs, got the wrong one there, sorry. In Psalm 34, it says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. The only, the, the only way we can get rid of fear is first of all, confront it, recognize it, and then confess it, repent. And then thirdly, claim God's promise of protection. Claim God's promise of protection. God gives us so many promises of protection for his children. Copy down the verses, put it on a three by five card, hang it up in your house, in your workplace, wherever you are, so that when the spirit of fear starts to overcome, you can go back and you can read it and you can claim it over and over again. For example, in Psalm 27, in verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, that word strength it, it can be translated stronghold, and it refers to a military position on a hilltop that is fortified to resist the enemy. You see, David uses a metaphor for refuge and security that he wants us to understand. In Psalm 118, in verse 6, it says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. Now, understand, when we look at history, it records many times people who were persecuted because of their loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, understand, this is not a guarantee of divine protection against abuse, but the rhetorical question, what can man do to me, shows confidence that no matter what someone does to us as Christians, our life remains in God's hands. Amen? There are many, many more verses that you can find for yourself, but look into God's word, get the verses, write them down, and remind yourself over and over and over again of God's promises to you. And then when the enemy begins to whisper fearful thoughts to your mind, you can combat it with God's word. Remember, after Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he went into the wilderness. It says the tempter came to him. And he tried to tempt him. And how did Jesus defeat the tempter? He used God's word. If it worked for Jesus, it'll work for you and me as well. We've got to claim God's word. We've got to recite God's word. We've got to say it again and again and again. Well, fourthly, we need to cultivate a closer relationship with God. We need to cultivate a closer relationship with God. Constantly recall God's faithfulness to you. All 12 spies saw the same thing. And yet two men came back with different views. They, they said, we can do this. What was the difference? Because 10 spies compared the giants to themselves. But two men, Joshua and Caleb, they compared the giants to their God. And the reason God blessed those two is because they, they were different than the other 10. What made the difference? Well, in Deuteronomy 136, it says, because he, Caleb, followed the Lord wholeheartedly. In Numbers 14, 24, it says, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and followed me wholly. In Numbers 32, 12, it says, For they, referring to Joshua and Caleb, have wholly followed the Lord. What's it mean to wholly follow the Lord? It means to be faithful to him even when you don't understand all the situation, all the circumstances. It means to be fearless in the face of a battle, fearless in the face of crisis. It means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, God's word says, Ephesians says, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled, be filled, be filled. Never stop being filled with the Spirit. What made the difference? They wholeheartedly followed the Lord. They had a strong relationship with God that dominated their entire life. You see, Joshua and Caleb looked at the giants and said, this is no big deal for God. And can't you just visualize as Joshua is meeting with the troops, these young men, never seen battle before, and he's telling them, you know, God's going to give us the victory. Don't worry. And you know what? God has done such a special work for you guys. I don't want you to be intimidated because God has given you such big targets you cannot miss. Don't worry, guys. You can't miss. And he's trying to encourage them. We can do this because God has called us to do this. God has given us the land. 
You see, we should cultivate a relationship with God today so that we can refer back to who God is, what God is capable of doing, so that when, not if, but when the tests and trials come, we can be fearless. We can have a perspective, nothing, nothing is too hard for our God. Nothing is too difficult for Him. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Do you ever stop and think, what is the opposite of fear? The opposite of fear is love. God has not given us a fearful spirit. He's given us a spirit of love, a spirit of power, love, and a strong mind. Now, how is love the opposite of fear? When your child's small and you, they wake up in the middle of the night and they're crying and you as a parent, you, you get up and you go into the room and, and what do you do? Son, you got to be courageous now. Stop that crying. Is that what you do? No, you probably pick them up and you hug them, maybe rock them a little bit, shh, 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 shh. maybe sing them a little song. Tell them everything's going to be okay. What are you doing? You're pouring out your love to that child. You want them to know that you're there. They can feel safe. They can feel secure. When we realize how much God loves us, we realize he loves us too much to allow us these things to come to our life to destroy us. He is our father who loves us desperately. And as we cultivate that love back to him, as he has taught us by his love for us, then fear begins to fade. And we're able to reach out to others and help them through the very dark times they're going through. We're able to encourage others because we have experienced God's perfect love. And God's perfect love casts out fear. Ten men change the course of a nation in a negative way. And I'm wondering, do we have ten men or ten women here today who are willing to stand up and say, God, use me. Use me to influence this nation. Use me to influence my family. Use me to impact this community. If you're willing to be that man or that woman, I'm just I'm going to ask you to just stand right now. I'm going to lead in prayer. And understand, God's going to hold you accountable for this decision. God, you can count on me. I'm going to be that man. I'm going to be that woman. I want to make a difference for the Lord Jesus Christ, for our nation, for my family. I want to make a difference right here where you've planted me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we stand before you as a living sacrifice. And just like Joshua and Caleb, we want to wholeheartedly commit ourselves to you. We want to influence our nation. We want to influence our families. We want to influence the next generation to love the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I'm asking that you give us a holy boldness so that when the trials and battles come, we can be fearless men and women for you. Help us, God, to be faithful even when we don't understand. And this morning, we want to claim Ephesians 5.18, to be filled, to be filled, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God, not our way, not our desire, but we want Jesus Christ to be exalted and glorified. And we commit ourselves to you now. And all God's people shouted out,